Hello and welcome everyone to the second uh, plenary session of uh, Equip 23. I am Subhabuti from uh, India and we are hosting this event online, as you know. Today we are in the Annamani Hall. Annamani is a very inspiring Indian physicist and metrologist. She was known as the Weather Women of India. She retired as the Deputy Director General of the Indian Meteorological Department. Annamani, after graduating from college, she got a fellowship to work with uh, Professor C.V. Raman, and she worked on optical properties of ruby and diamond, and she authored five research papers, but she did not get her PhD after she submitted her dissertation because she did not have her MSc degree. So uh, then she went to Imperial College London, and uh, there she shifted to meteorological studies. She standardized the drawings of close to 100 weather instruments, making India independent in weather instruments. And she set up a network of stations to measure the solar radiation. And in 1963, at the request of Bikram Sarabhai, she successfully set up a meteorological observatory and an instrumentation tower at the Thumba rocket launching facility. She wrote many books. She got several awards. You can see her biography in the screen. And now I hand over the session to Professor Shudeshna Sina from ISAR Mohali to chair the session. Thank you. She's the deputy director. She was the deputy director of ISAR Mohali. And now she will be chairing our session. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Srubhabhati. Uh, so a warm welcome to everyone for the second uh, plenary session. Uh, to flag off this uh, session, we have uh, Professor Rupu Manjari Ghosh, and I have the great privilege of, of you know, introducing her. Um, uh, uh, Professor Rupa served as the Vice Chancellor of Shiv Nadar University. This is in the Delhi NCR region for two terms. And uh, she was the founding director of the, the School of uh, National Science and the founding dean of graduate studies and research uh, in Shiv Nadar. So in fact, under her, uh, able uh, leadership, um, Shivnadar became an institute of eminence within a few years of its existence, really quite a remarkable feat. Um, and uh, before Shivnadar, she was uh, a professor of physics and the Dean of School of Physical Sciences at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. And um, I, I actually do remember her um, uh, when she had joined as an assistant professor. Um, uh, and I was, uh, you know, a grad student, so we go back a long way there. Um, okay. Uh, and <clears throat> to, uh, I should just also mention here that she has a very well recognized PhD uh, from the University of Rochester, where she had worked as a Rush Rees Fellow, um, chosen for outstanding uh, scholarly ability and the promise of exceptional contribution to scholarship and teaching. Of course, this is a promise. This has been more than uh, realized over the years. Uh, lastly, I should mention that besides her contributions to research and teaching, which is all the way from you know, school level to the university, she's also well known for her stand and efforts to bring in uh, gender justice and environmental uh, consciousness and sustainability in higher education system. So over to um, uh, Professor Ghosh, uh, and we look forward to your uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Subeshna, for this very nice introduction. I'm really privileged to, uh, to, to deliver uh, this plenary session in this conference. Uh, thanks to Vandana and uh, Shubhavrati. I mean, they have done a wonderful job and uh, really my privilege. So in the half an hour that's allocated to me, I've been also told to share uh, my journey. So let me start by sharing my screen. I hope you can see this. Yes. Yeah, Sudeshna, visible? Yes, yes, absolutely okay. visible. Yeah. So uh, I have sort of titled it My Journey in Physics. And uh, when I started, of course, I did not know that there will be something called a second quantum revolution. But it so happens that my entire research journey in physics has been along the path of the second quantum revolution. So I'll uh, talk about that. And hopefully that would be of some interest given today's excitement, and I'll touch upon that. So this is not meant to be, a, uh, you know, in half an hour or 35 minutes, I won't be able to cover the details, but I'll give you ample references if you wish to. So uh, really uh, very nice uh, to be here uh, today. 
So let me uh, get started by one slide where I show who, I mean, you know, Sudhishna has already talked about it, but the timelines really. So it has been a pretty long journey. 1987 is when I finished my PhD uh, in Rochester in quantum optics. And I'll talk about that work a bit because that really is the starting point of what I did afterwards. And I joined uh, uh, JNU from 1988 to 2012. I was there a pretty long time, 24 years. And initial years, uh, I, uh, you know, I met Sudeshna and it's been a, a long lasting friendship ever since. So uh, in Jane, I got to do many things, not just teach and do research in physics. Uh, I became the chairperson by chance. You know, it was, I was not trained for it. The gender committee, which was called the GS Cash, Gender Sensitization Committee Against Sexual Harassment uh, in 2001. And that's the first time uh, in a residential university campus, the rules and procedures were written by us and uh, that became a standard for the entire country. Eventually, I became the dean. In between, I have been the director of the academic staff college, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, many things. In 2012, I joined Shivnada University, and I moved to kind of administration, the dark side of things in academia, uh, that uh, as the founding director of School of Natural Sciences. So the mandate was to set up physics, chemistry, mathematics, and life sciences as a research university. I'm also the founding dean of graduate studies and research. So master's PhD and the research program had to be given shape. Uh, there again, I became the founding chairperson of the first gender committee at SNU. Uh, I was also the founding head of the faculty development center, as you can see in a new university in the private space. And there are very few senior people. So uh, I was essentially starting and doing a lot of the groundwork. And then eventually I became uh, the vice chancellor uh, for two terms uh, that ended last year. Uh, SNU received the Autel Incubation Center grant in 2017 uh, under me. And of course, as Sudeshna mentioned, a very you know, pride moment for me and the institution was when it was uh, given this tag of institution of eminence. Uh, it was the youngest private university, youngest institution to be called like the existing institution to be called that. Uh, I had had very productive international collaborations. I'll mention some today. Today, I continue as a DST First Committee member. I'm in the Research Council of CSIR, CSIO. I'm in the Governing Council of RRI and Governing Council of many such bodies. I don't need to bore you with the details. But what has been a new journey is I've been recently asked to be part of the board of the Executive Leadership Academy of University of California, Berkeley. And uh, of course, the first international program happened at SNU before I quit. And uh, now uh, on the board of that executive leadership academy, probably will have a chance to define leadership. And that, of course, has to be an inclusive leadership agenda that uh, I hope to drive uh, globally. So uh, that's very briefly who I am. And much of what I'm going to talk about will be based on these experiences. And uh, I'll be happy to answer questions if you have any uh, in the end. So uh, since I have titled it as the second quantum revolution, let me define this first. You know, the so-called first quantum revolution in embryo lasers and transistors based on the rules of quantum mechanics. Uh, what is now called the second quantum revolution, I do not agree with this nomenclature. You may not agree either, but that's what the world is calling it. So the second quantum revolution aims to control quantum systems. So it's uh, the, the technology, Quantum technologies that everybody is talking about today, we seek to use quantum phenomena in computing, communication, sensing, and metrology uh, that uh, you just heard the introduction from Surabhuti off. So to go beyond what classical systems can do, beyond unknown life, what we can do today. So that's exactly what the path has been. And uh, you know the excitement today, everybody knows, I don't need to go through this in great detail, is the national quantum mission that got announced in April uh, with a budget of 6,000 crore for till 31. So, but it's a lot of money for to set up mainly four thematic hubs, uh, quantum computing, quantum communication, quantum sensing and metrology, and quantum materials, et cetera. So I think uh, there's a lot of excitement in the country right now to, uh, you know, to get to this and make it a very successful mission. And 
Before that, what happened is a long due recognition in uh, last year's Nobel Prize in Physics that was given to three people. Uh, of these, uh, probably you are familiar with most of them. Uh, Alain Aspre has been a great friend of mine for a long time. Uh, he's from France, uh, John Closure, and Anton Zeilinger. So they got the Nobel Prize and the citation, if you look at the Nobel Prize citation, it says, for experiments with entangled photons, establishing the violation of Bell inequalities and pioneering quantum information science. The Bell inequality part, I'll not have time to go through. Uh, it would need uh, at least an hour to talk about all of it, but I'll give you a flavor of what uh, these are, uh, starting from where I started. And uh, that has been kind of uh, the beginning. Uh, so what exactly we talk about when we talk about quantumness are basically two things. One is in quantum mechanics, there is no concept of locality because the wave function will have an extension. So uh, strange things can happen uh, if uh, many photons or many atoms can be linked in a single wave of light or matter. So uh, that basically means that, you know, uh, it's a kind of uh, Sai Baba effect, as I call it, now that I'm in Delhi, you cannot see me in Mumbai, but if I had been a quantum particle with my wave function extending from Mumbai to Delhi, then there's a finite probability of observing me anywhere uh, in, this, in this extension of locality. So I think that really is the crux of the matter. And this led to something called entanglement, which was cited in the Nobel Prize. This is what Einstein calls spooky action at a distance. So what happens to one of the particles in an entangled, like a twin pair, determines what happens to the other particle as if one particle effectively knows something about the twin instantaneously. So are we violating some kind of uh, causality? So even if they're far apart, uh, action on one affects the, uh, the other one in the entangled pair. Now, what is the use of such things? I'm going to basically talk about that. But the second interesting feature of quantum, uh, quantum mechanics is there is no reality that's independent of observers and measurement, whereas first one is your resource. The second one creates problem for experiments because uh, you know uh, earlier physics used to be thought as of as there is an objective reality out there. And by doing careful experiments and by theorizing, we essentially extract elements of that reality. But it turns out in quantum mechanics, you cannot really measure anything without disturbing the system. So uh, the observer is extremely important. If I ask you, have you seen the moon? The answer would be yes, uh, because either you have seen it or somebody who has seen it has told you. So, so I think uh, the moon exists irrespective of whether you are observing it or not. But in quantum mechanics, in situations, you can actually disturb the reality by just simply making uh, an observation or a measurement. So uh, I would not get into the Bell inequalities uh, because uh, this, this really is quantification uh, by a mathematical inequality by the genius of John Bell in 1964 that says that if there are hidden variables, uh, the correlation between the results of a large number of measurements will never exceed a certain limit. But uh, these were uh, you know, decisive experiments done by Clauser and then uh, Alain Aspey this was in 1982 or so. I'll not get into the details of it because that's not really important for the story that I'm going to read today. But uh, what I'm going to talk about is the two photon interference process that started to uh, show results uh, fairly recently. Now it was actually a classic textbook by Dirac, Principles of Quantum Mechanics that came out in 1958, uh, where he wrote that each photon interferes only with itself Interference between different photons never occurs. Now, in my experiments and theory, I basically violated this statement and I showed that it was possible to make two photons being emitted by independent sources interfere. Let me uh, say a bit more on that. So essentially to do that, you have to use light in specific quantum states. Uh, They're not classical light really, and these can be used as independent sources. There are two examples that I have studied way back and uh, one, the one, the second one that's highlighted there, twin photons from the down converter became the classic thing uh, that everybody started using later. And the theory of this two photon interference using the down converter uh, was shown in this 
physical review paper in 1986. I did the theory first to convince my boss. And then I did the experiment that came out in a PRL the next year. So uh, what are, these are the, those papers? I would not spend too much time on this, but there is a very interesting physics that uh, came out of this particular source. Uh, what I found out that two photons could never be detected at two points separated by an odd number of half, whatever the, the separation is, despite the fact that one photon can be detected anywhere. So uh, this called for the quantum mechanical interpretation of interference that was by Dirac. So essentially I was violating Dirac's statement, but I was resonating with the concept of interference that he has propagated in his book, that the, if there are two independent uh, indistinguishable paths that uh, the two particles are following, then it's the, uh, the interference of these two probability amplitudes corresponding to the two indistinguishable paths that causes interference. And so the, these interference could be destructive at certain pairs of points where you actually don't see uh, correlated photons. So one photon can be detected anywhere on the detection plane, but two photons together at two points x and x prime cannot be detected when they're separated by uh, a, a specific uh, length. So that really was very, very surprising. And it sort of got flashed in many, uh, even in textbooks. And I'm going to quote this because I'm sure you can't read it. It talked about a new source from nonlinear optics. The process I used that I'm calling a down converter is it of a day-to-day -day use today, but in 1986, 87, it was not. So Alain Asprey used a different source to do his Bell inequality experiment. But then in uh, 1985, I started at the University of Rochester uh, through a process known by the intimidating name of spontaneous parametric down conversion, a single ultraviolet photon could fission into two if it passed through certain crystals. So uh, these two down converted photons, so you pass a UV photon, and it became two infrared photons, let's say like a spontaneous photon fission. And these two infrared photons that are down converted in frequency are in an entangled state, perfectly suited to a whole range of new experiments. So this really was a new source for the first time shown by my experiments in 1986-87. Uh, so this experiment was similar to the EPR uh, thought experiment, uh, but there's something quite remarkable and uh, it was totally non-classical, but not quite like the Bell inequality. So there is a new source and a new experiment. That's what this book talks about. And uh, what I showed is that this two photon interference could not simply be described in terms of interference of two independent photons, but must be envisioned as superposition among two indistinguishable two photon amplitudes. So quantum mechanics was saved. The interpretation was correct, but it sort of gave to all of physicists uh, a new kind of a source for entanglement because of the first experiment that I did. It came out even in popular science, this book probably some of you have read. Unfortunately, Lisa, uh, Lisa Gilda, who had talked to me, but still referred to me in this book as working on his PhD, his, that's the bias. And she corrected it later, but it never got corrected in the book. So in that popular uh, science book, uh, the, the story that she talks about is that uh, one day Horn was wandering through Schultz's lab when he saw a recent PRL coming to it in upon their double diamond experiment done from theory to fact by me. And uh, they have discovered the entanglement latent when light strikes a crystal in a beautiful process or intimidating process. This down conversion turned out to be the ideal source to perform the two particle interferometry experiment that Horn, Zeilinger, you know, these are the, uh, the Nobel Prize winning experiment. So my work is kind of sandwiched between Alain Espe and Zeilinger, uh, the two Nobel laureates of 2022. So this really is a source of entangled photons using this, that what I did is uh, shown in the, the, the first figure on the right is taken from my old paper. The photo below is, uh, is from Zeilinger's initial down conversion experiments. So around these cones, uh, the photon pairs are coming out and they're entangled in polarization, but you can actually do other stuff with this as well. So a, a wonderful source of entangled photons. And that's something that I continued working on much later, uh, probing entanglement. 
uh, what basically is says that a quantum state of each particle of a group which, are, which is entangled cannot be described independently of the state of the others, including when the particles are separated by large distance. That's really is the funny part in quantum mechanics, and that's the mystery of quantum correlations I went on to explore further. Now, all this is fine. As I said, what's the use? Now, as everybody knows today, probably even school kids are talking about it, the concept of quantum parallelism exhibited by a single photon in a double slit interferometer, that can be exploited to construct a quantum computer. What does that mean? Because if you have a single photon that went through two slits simultaneously, um, they, it didn't quite go, don't take it literally like a path, but it has a probability amplitude of going through both the slits simultaneously. Then there is an immense uh, parallel processing machine probably you can imagine using these, uh, you know, uh, photon through slit A, photon through slit B, photon upstairs, photon downstairs, uh, cat that is dead and alive together. It's like saying no and yes together in maybes. So in finite number of possibilities in a qubit, not just a binary digit or a bit, which are strings of zeros and ones, but a qubit, a quantum bit, is really a combination like this, C00 plus C11. So it could really hold uh, very, very powerful info, information rich states. So the main problem, the second one that I talked about, observation is a problem because how do you produce, observe and make use of these, uh, these uh, information rich states is the point that where we all got stuck. And this is what everybody talks about uh, from my time is uh, the quantum challenge. And the name of the book I showed was also called that. So quantum mechanics basically shows up in small enclaves within the classical macro world, the behavior of individual constituents that make up our world, for example, atoms and photons, those are described by quantum mechanics, but these particles are rarely isolated. And as they interact with the environment, they lose their peculiar quantum character. So a central question in quantum physics is the mechanism of transition between the quantum and the classical world. So our, in our world, I have not seen a cat which is both dead and alive. I have not seen myself being both in Bombay and Delhi. So we are not quantum objects. So is there a door that you open to go to the quantum world or vice versa? And that has been a question that I have probed with my students quite a bit. Uh, the other part of the quantum challenge is to make a measurement. One not only needs to keep a quantum system isolated, but also probe it delicately, as I said, because a measurement affects the quantum system. Uh, so a single particle detection was known to even Schrodinger. This is just an anecdote way back in 1952 or so. And he called it post-mortem physics. Uh, so uh, when you actually destroy the object under investigation while probing it. So that was like post-mortem, <laughs> the quantum physics, the, the richness that you have. So essentially observing such fragile quantum effects and then making use of a system's quantum nature were really tough and challenging tasks. We have come a long way. Uh, th so the main issue that everybody talked about, and you know, I am re referring to a popular article in MIT Technology Review by Shankar Das Sarma, many of you may be familiar with his work. And uh, he wrote about quantum computing as a hype problem. And even last year, what he was talking about is that quantum states essentially, quantum states disappear and the process is called decoherence in the presence of environmental noise and error corrections are difficult. So that really is the main issue of realizing a quantum computer. And uh, what exactly is this? The reason I mentioned this is this needs a lot more probing that is happening. We have contributed to this issue quite a bit and I would not get into the details of it. So uh, the question that uh, young students should probably ask is how well do we understand the process of loss of coherence and emergence of classicality? Uh, now the quantum error correction that everybody's working on is because of this. That's the single most important technology for the future of quantum computing to, to handle decoherence. The fact that quantum particles are never isolated, uh, they're coupled to what is around them, the environment. So there are two familiar things that we know even in classical physics, uh, whenever you have uh, energy irreversibly being transferred from a system to its environment, it causes dissipation of energy, but then associated with you have fluctuations, uh, but then uh, in quantum domain, there is an additional feature 
and that's what this decoherence is. Um, you know, the, the relevance of decoherence is not just for quantum computing and quantum information, because essentially what you should be worried about is time to perform elementary unitary transformation involving the qubits should be well within this quantum coherence time. Otherwise you lose your quantumness. But it's, uh, it's a very big issue for quantum measurement problem. And there is a uh, editor series webinar. Some of you probably have seen it that came out uh, end of May, again, on this very topic. But then the thir third thing I would say is explanation of the emergence of the classical world from quantum mechanics. And the fourth one uh, that has puzzled me quite a bit uh, is the arrows of time problem. Why does time never go backward and is irreversible? So I think that's something that can be answered through, uh, through handling this decorrence problem. And in uh, very briefly, what it, uh, okay, I'm running out of time, but uh, what it basically says that if I have a spin up and down uh, as my system and the apparatus is also a detector, which has, is, uh, can detect spin up and down, then in the basis, uh, system up, detector up, and system down, detector down, the density matrix would look like what this two by two matrix that I have shown in there. What is interesting are these off diagonal blue colored terms that correspond to superpositions of macroscopically distinct outcomes of being up or down. So these are classically unacceptable, essentially quantum. So uh, in, in quantum mechanics, you don't have any dynamics to reduce these uh, off diagonal elements to zero. You have a prescription that says that you know from your pocket you just set those off diagonal elements to zero and from a pure density matrix get to a mixed density matrix the row r that i have written in there this row r is easily interpretable like classical probabilities and your problem is solved but nobody tells you how actually you set the off diagonal terms to zero uh, so there are some details on the slide that i don't need to get into that but what i wanted to say is that this this is something that we have probed for a very long time, uh, essentially asking the question, how does classical behavior emerge from quantum dynamics? So I think you can take a look at it. It's an interesting one, but we have sort of limited ourselves to interesting questions uh, in systems that could be solved exactly. But uh, I think we need to look at this a little more carefully, given that this is the most important point problem in quantum computing. The kind of questions that are relevant are, how does decoherence evolve in time? How does decoherence affect an n qubit entanglement? How does it depend on that n? How can decoherence be controlled and or tested experimentally so and so forth? So I think this is, this is an area where we have done a lot of work, but then a lot more work is to be done. Uh, I want to quickly switch and then the next, uh, three, four minutes, just want to talk about the concept of a memory in a quantum computing, for example. And that is using, uh, again, our own work uh, by a phenomenon called EIT, electromagnetically induced transparency. As the name suggests, this is a translation of resonant absorption and whereby uh, resonant light can be transmitted through an otherwise opaque medium. So this is an old concept, but then it got revived in, uh, recently. And to show you a cartoon, this is what we are, I'm really talking about. Simple thing to remember for uh, students in the audience. Uh, if you are familiar with uh, a two-level system uh, where maybe it's separated by an energy of h bar omega naught, and I'm probing it with a red laser of frequency omega. Now the detuning is delta. So if I plot the absorption in the system and associated dispersion as a function of the detuning delta. When delta is zero, that is when the probe laser is exactly on resonance with the transition, your maximum absorption population gets lifted upstairs. So the light gets absorbed and dispersion shows this very negative steep dispersion. <laughs> you can alter this by adding a third level and as you know, kind of a strong laser, not too, too bright, uh, that where you had a previous absorption uh, peak at delta equal to zero, now you get a transparency window. Instead of a peak, peak you now have a dip. So essentially it talks about a, a transparency window and the dispersion profile gets uh, drastically modified 
to a very steep positive dispersion. This extreme positive dispersion in the transparency window uh, leads to something that we call slow light. I mean, the concept of slow light is not that uh, unique. You know that when light goes through vacuum, is, the speed is known. When it goes through any material, it gets slowed down. And you talk about that as the refractive index of that material. But refractive index of, of the order of one or three or six, that's not what you're talking about here. You can easily get a group index, NG that I've written on the left, uh, of the order of 10 to the power six, 10 to the power seven, even 10 to the power eight. So how slow can it get? A question that you would ask is, can I stop light inside this material using EIT? And if you do that, whatever is coded in your light, maybe you'd be able to store it. And that would serve as a memory. I will not get into the uh, details of this, but very interesting that I talked about interference from my PhD days. And this EIT, the physics of it, can also be understood by uh, the interference in between the multiple roots of excitation. One is a direct one, B2A. The other one was an indirect one mediated by the coupling one. These two paths uh, you know, interfere by, and then cancel the absorption along B to A, the probe absorption. And that something is really the basic physics of EIT, electromagnetically induced transparency. There is, of course, a coherence time involved in this. That's called the Raman coherence time, which is uh, the coherence between the two lower levels. I'll skip the basic idea uh, and get to an understanding of it. Essentially, uh, first trick is to select a simple usable atomic level configuration. We have worked uh, a lot on this using helium at room temperature. So essentially, you're talking about bulk quantum mechanics at room temperature. By itself, it's an interesting process. And this is something that we have worked quite some time on. And I'll not get into the details of it. But I'll feel in uh, not mentioning my great collaborators, Fabian Rittnecker, who I have collaborated for a long time with, and the helium experiments were done with Fabian Gold for in, uh, in particular. We have had a series of uh, Indo French projects, uh, graded excellent, and it has been really fun and very fruitful collaboration playing with atoms and light. Uh, the, these are the journal papers that you can probably look up by looking at this EIT, the adiabatic transfer, and the slow light and the atomic memory kind of concepts. So uh, forgive me for skipping all of this, but there are fundamental questions one can ask uh, from this, what I just talked about. If you look at the group velocity expression that I've written on top, this is a textbook one where the denominator has been truncated up after the first order of derivative of real part of susceptibility with frequency. I get slow light when the NG, the group index, is much greater than one. Because your group velocity of light inside the material becomes much smaller than the free space speed C. But what about if NG is less than one? Then group velocity will be actually greater than C. And we can even get backward light when NG is less than zero, negative. So this is very, very counterintuitive because people thought when I was in school, uh, high school, people said that nothing can exceed the uh, the speed of light. And then when I was in the US, phase velocity could be higher than C. And now I'm saying is that group velocity can be higher than C. Does that violate Einstein's causality? It actually doesn't. It's something that one can prove and have fun with that uh, because nothing is, the information is not propagating faster than C. The group velocity is actually going higher. So this needs another one hour. But we had fun probing this as well. Uh, I'll again skip the other ways of manipulating and creating these memory effects. There's a lot that one could do in creating a switch. All of these are all optical gadgets for uh, quantum uh, computer. So uh, the theory for that we have done uh, recently. There is a PRL that probably you could see on light storage that from our group that came out in 2017. So the idea is, can you stop and restart light at will? And uh, that's something that 
is, is a possibility that I give you an overview of where we are. Uh, the quantum memory concept is basically a flying qubit moving to a stationary qubit and being retrieved at will. So that's extremely important. And there's some reviews that I've cited there that came out last year uh, as to what is the status of EIT-based quantum memory. There's a lot that people have been able to do it. Particularly, I mentioned one where uh, the storage times were about one second, which is quite large. If you can do 10 to one nine or more uh, operations within a second. So um, we are essentially looking at primarily concepts of information networks. Classical information networks, www, you know, quantum information network or quantum internet will process and store quantum information through quantum bits. And uh, so there is a potential advantage of perfectly secure data transmission, which Urbushi and others are working on uh, at RRI. So there is a whole lot of unexplored problems in here. We have talked about it. If you send the quantum information from a photonic channel to an atomic node, and take it out again, atomic node to photonic channel without knowing what the quantum information is. Because the moment you know, you measure, you actually destroy it. So essentially there is a transfer problem that also is a very interesting one, which we have worked and have fun working with this. But that's for those who want, uh, can look at the reference. So I, I will end by saying, how close are we to realizing the dream of quantum information processing? The initial, systems were uh, based on trapped ions and a lot of work going on in solid state superconducting circuits. Google and IBM probably have seen, there's a lot of progress that's coming up. Uh, I don't want to bore you with all these details, but there are interesting stories right here. But what is exciting for us today is that there is a third real system that has come up last year at, uh, using uh, neutral atoms as qubits. And because they're neutral, uh, this is a milestone because it would be much easier to scale up than the two earlier technologies. And this uh, is back-to-back -back papers in Nature last year in April uh, from two groups that actually made this possible. So excitement really going on. And there's a lot of uh, different approaches from analog quantum model to quantum annealing, uh, and universal quantum kit model to different ones. Uh, students can look up these quantum computing startups as of this year, this is the status that I could see. They're very interesting ones. They're startups that actually deliver a quantum processor on demand. So one can look that up and I'll actually stop by saying that they're interesting ones, including one, um, the last one I have shown in this trip is done as an Indian one. Uh, these are quantum computer simulator toolkits and uh, a whole lot of uh, fun games available in there whether you are a mature or a professional, but some of these things take time. For example, Q-tip, the, the last but one, uh, takes time to understand. So the programming language is nothing new. So you have uh, really development libraries that are available and one can have fun with. So moral of the story for me has been for in, my, uh, in my life in physics, is uh, the evolution of physics happens when theory and experiment go hand in hand. Very uh, critical applications come out and we never go jobless in physics. It's not like I solve the problem, so therefore there'll be no job left. The scientific methodology as we have described, which critically depends on experiments would continue and the frontier of knowledge would keep on expanding. So it has been a fun journey uh, doing physics uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Sudeshna. Uh, yes, um, I see a couple of um, questions in the chat box. Uh, um, can you see it too or? Uh... Maybe you can read out, that will be better. Okay, question. Okay, have... okay, I'll read it out. So um, there is a question from um, Dr. Usha Devi and um, she asks, um, do you think if there is any uh, if there is any connection between uh, EIT with quantum metrology, more specifically, if we are looking at the measurement of omega transition frequency between the two levels and the fluctuations in measuring omega, uh, would addition of the third level help in reducing fluctuations analogous to atomic clock precision in metrology? Yes, 
Yeah, it's a very good question, uh, as expected from Usha. Uh, the, uh, the, it's a possibility, has not been done exactly that way. In metrology, what you'd be interested in actually getting is a more accurate definition of your omega, the transition frequency, right? So, uh, so if you could stop the, uh, the like Doppler broadening and all those things have been attempted in four systems. So I'm not using, now I'm using a room temperature system where I'm actually getting rid of that. But there's a trick in room temperature systems. Uh, there is an essential um, uh, compromise you have with the, because you have to avoid collisions to maintain your coherence. So uh, that optical density is a compromised uh, quantity in EIT room temperature. But EIT can be done in cold atoms. I'm not sure that would effectively be more uh, economical, but definitely it's the right thinking. It's really uh, it's, it's really the same thing as in atomic clocks in uh, metrology when they're using cold systems. Yes. Does it answer you, yeah. Usha? Yeah, I don't think uh, we can hear her, but okay. I'm, uh, yeah, um, so, uh, yeah. Ah, she says thank you, so it does. <laughs> uh, so there is a second question uh, from Archana Tiwari. And um, she asks, I, I, I'm, I'm quoting verbatim, uh, spin decoherence can be usually and easily refined via controlling the environment and external perturbations. Why, uh, well, presumably, are these spin-based quantum computing systems not much uh, successful experimentally? Well, I think uh, they have been quite successful. It's, uh, it's not like they have not been successful. The main issue is the following. Uh, main advantage of photonic systems is the following. See, the um, uh, photons interact very weakly with its, their environment, right? So you, you have a natural control over decoherence. You don't have to do much. The atom photon systems, the mm -hmm. atom part is like spin coherence that you are talking about. So people do need to. The Raman coherence I talked about is like uh, the spin coherence. So you can think of the two lower levels as a spin up and down. It's basically the same thing. So I think uh, everybody is looking at the same thing uh, ultimately. Uh, if you have completely neutral systems, uh, what people are looking at both for photons, which has a natural low decoherence, and for uh, you know spin systems where you could uh, you know if you have neutral systems, then they are uh, there is decoherence is already controlled. So I think they're natural advantages. That's what people are looking at. But yes, spin decorrence is pretty much on the agenda to, to, to be controlled. Right. Sudeshna, right. I ha. have a yeah. ha. Yes, yes, please. I have a question. Sorry, because I can't raise the hand in the Zoom. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 Uh, uh -huh. So first of all, uh, very, very nice talk. Rukmanjri, I'm not in the field and being outside, it was really very nice to follow the talk and also very nicely you uh, summarized a very inspiring journey. Uh, but just coming back to the question, maybe it's very naive, that, uh, but the thing which you talked about neutral atoms really is very, very intriguing. And do you think that this will be a kind of a breakthrough in the quantum computation now? Yes, I do believe two groups, at least two groups are working extensively. But uh, unfortunately, if you, I had a photograph today, I, you know, it's a short talk, didn't show you that. The systems are quite clumsy. So uh, field ones, so are the IBM and Google systems. So I don't know which one would be, uh, will be winning in terms of practicality, but I think neutral mm -hmm. atoms have a very good scope uh, of uh, moving in that direction. Actually the helium system we worked on, though it was just a model system, not very practical, uh, is exactly in that direction. So I think it has a tremendous potential because you can scale it up. Scaling up is uh, and without decoherence. So decoherence is the main culprit and, and scaling up is the other problem. So you can scale it up by controlling decoherence because they are neutral systems. I really think there's a lot of potential in there. But is, these are clumsy systems, no, no, no doubt. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, I see uh, another uh, question. Um, from Ru and Pang, um, and um, this is compared with other information carriers. What advantages do photons have for quantum information processes? 
Well, uh, the main advantage, as I said, you know, uh, if you look at Maxwell's equations, uh, photon plus photon interactions are not there. So photons interact only when there is a material medium and you can make them interact. But they, the main thing which we have always thought was uh, uh, nonlinear optics uh, was brought in because we wanted photons to interact with each other. So I think that is their advantage because interaction is so low that uh, it's, uh, it's a natural advantage. So I, I really think that given the speed and uh, the, the lack of interaction are two very strong points in favor of photons. Right. Uh, so uh, we are more or less out of uh, time. I just wanted, uh, if I may ask one very, very uh, naive question since I'm not in Please. the field at all. Yeah. So uh, in, in this, in the, in the computer science uh, um, uh, framework, um, the fact that uh, uh, quantum computing uh, allows reversible uh, uh, operations is, is a big thing, right? I mean, it, a lot of thing hinges on that. So this arrow of time is, a, is, is quite a danger there, right? And, or of course, a standard collapse is terrible also, I suppose. Yes. Uh, any yeah, comments I, I, I think all of these, uh, there are limits to the processing because of the things you mentioned. Hmm. So you have to work within those limits and then everything would be all right. Yeah. The arrow of time would be explained. I know that would take another hour, so I'll not get into yeah, the details right, of it. Right, you right. know that classically, statistically, the way you handle it, a similar hmm. stuff can be done. Uh, so the decorrence is another side of the same story. Hmm. It's really yeah. the irreversibility of time that's showing up as decorrence. So uh, we have found ways of controlling that. And okay. everything, any, any operation you want to do, how many numbers, you have to do within that quantum coordinates time. Yeah, because you have to concatenate several operations to get a reasonable uh, uh, operation. Absolutely. Right? Uh, and and so, so all that has to be put into this. Uh, and you know, time. there is a, because you mentioned, everybody's talking about so many qubits IBM yeah. has done, so yeah. many qubits. That's not really the point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, you have to do that operation. So I think- Operation it, concatenated. Yeah, so that's yes. a point. That yeah. really okay. is the H, and but mm -hmm. we are getting there. I think there's been mm -hmm. significant progress in the last few years. And I think there are more to think about, more to do. And that's why, yeah. you know, starting in 1985 or whenever I started in this mm. path, creating mm. these sources, mm. till today it's such a hot topic. So I've been very lucky <laughs> <laughs> to be in this yeah. area and enjoying it all the way. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much for that talk. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And uh, uh, may I ask, so should we uh, then maybe wrap up uh, this talk since I've seen no other yes. questions unless yes. there's anything on YouTube is there or no, 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 no. Okay. Yeah. okay okay yeah. okay okay so so thank you again very much uh, Rupa this thank was you. Uh, yeah really uh, really yeah. enjoyable and informative yeah okay so uh, now uh, we go on to our uh, second um, talk uh, perhaps uh, um, yeah um, yes so our uh, second speaker is uh, Dr. Priyadarshini Karve. Um, uh, Vandana, uh, do you have a slide for her? Yeah, as, as, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm speaking as, as you put up this uh, slide. So um, Dr. Karve obtained her PhD in physics from the University of Pune in 1998. Uh, she works on um, rural cooking energy solutions, decentralized organic waste to fuel technologies, and strategies for low carbon sustainable urbanization. And she has developed an easy to use Samujit uh, carbon footprint calculator for urban Indians, people like us, a whole bunch of us, and conducts workshops focused on climate change literacy. Uh, she's the founder director of Samujit uh, in EnviroTech and the co-founder of Orja Books. And she's currently the national convener of Indian Network of Ethics and Climate Change, also called uh, INEC. And uh, she serves on the governing and advisory bodies of several national and international organizations. Uh, her work has been honored by national and international awards and recognition. So uh, over to you, Dr. Karve. We look forward to uh, learning about this from you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Just give me a second to get the spotlight. I will continue. I'll just change the yeah, yeah. I'll share my screen. <coughs> oh. 
Okay. Yes, we see it. Thank you. Yeah, great. So uh, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and uh, talking to people who are hardcore working in physics. I after doing PhD in physics, I have worked mostly in uh, uh, interdisciplinary areas using the knowledge and methodology of physics, but mainly to address uh, social and environmental problems. Uh, the, uh, the topic that I'm going to focus on today is my work uh, related to climate change education um, in the context of India, but also uh, in developing countries, uh, as I'm, I'm uh, realizing uh, that uh, perhaps the same strategies are applicable there also. Uh, this all started uh, around 2007, when I was approached by a, a Pune-based uh, uh, educational institute to develop interdisciplinary courses with focus on science but courses to be taught to arts and commerce students. And that led to uh, me designing two courses at the time. One was called Science and Sustainability, and the other was Living with Climate Change. So when I started teaching this course, uh, Living with Climate Change, um, initially, of course, I mean, it was about the uh, explaining the science of climate change in very simple terminology and then talking about what is what are likely to be the impacts, etc. And I found that the students are uh, increasingly getting scared and therefore losing interest. Uh, so I was rather uh, desperate as to what to do about this. So one of the uh, uh, exercises that I designed was around calculating their own carbon footprint. And uh, suddenly that sort of changed the atmosphere in the classroom because when the students saw how their day-to-day -day activities are contributing to this problem and also therefore how they can um, come up with solutions, uh, the, the interactions changed, the outlook towards the course changed, and that inspired me to uh, develop um, a workshop around uh, uh, people, the common people calculating their own carbon footprint and talking about climate change. This was, uh, as I uh, uh, mentioned, was around 2007-2008, when um, in India, not much uh, was being talked about around climate change. In general, there was still this uh, idea that this is a problem created by the developed world and will be solved by the developed world only. There is nothing much that we uh, sitting in a developing country can do about it. Uh, but uh, I was working at the same time with uh, groups within India and outside India, uh, which were uh, having to deal with climate change issues on a day-to-day -day basis. And I felt that there is a need for uh, a better and uh, more uh, sort of multidisciplinary understanding uh, around climate change uh, that needs to emerge uh, in the general population. Um, so I started thinking around this, that how can we uh, trigger a, sort of a massive campaign around climate change education? And I realized that we need to look at this um, three-dimensionally. Because when I was designing this course on living with climate change, uh, one thing one has to realize that uh, this is an evolving issue and therefore uh, books become outdated very fast. And internet then becomes the source of information and um, most of the information is coming from the developed world. Uh, there is also a huge amount of information coming from climate change deniers at one end of the spectrum and uh, the doomsday prophets on the other at the other end of the spectrum. So discerning between all of this is also essential. And, um, you know, I mean, pictures of polar bears floating on uh, icebergs don't really connect uh, with most people living in uh, in in the tropical uh, world. So uh, we need content which is more global in that sense. So I I sort of divide this challenge into these three dimensions that there is a time dimension to it, a space dimension, and there is a complexity dimension. So let me explain what I'm trying to stay here, uh, say here. Um, 
as far as the time dimension is concerned, uh, climate change as we see it today uh, is actually part of a much longer phenomenon. I mean, one has to contextualize it uh, in, in, in the planetary history. And then you come across this, that the Earth's atmosphere has been changing. Uh, so what is so special about what is happening now? How can we uh, so confidently say that humans are responsible for, uh, uh, for the changes that we are seeing today? These are the natural questions that arise, uh, which don't often get addressed. Uh, by by the uh, so-called educational content that is available. Uh, so this is one of the problems that I have come across. Another thing is that um, it's difficult for a common uh, a lay person to uh, relate uh, events and decisions that were taken hundreds of years ago, how they are affecting our lives today. Uh, and also therefore, uh, how our decisions today are going to affect things that are going to happen several decades from now. So, for example, um, currently uh, we are uh, globally trying to address climate change under Paris Agreement, which talks about um, keeping the increase in the Earth's average temperature below 1.5 degrees centigrade by 2100. And therefore, we are supposed to take certain steps today in 2023. So um, uh, why should I make compromises today for a desirable outcome in 2100? So these are questions that uh, come from uh, people. And um, it is important uh, that uh, educators and scientists answer these questions. Uh, uh, these are not just science questions. There is also a lot of other things that have to come into it. And that is why a, a, a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach is required. Um, the space issue is relatively uh, simpler to understand. Uh, if we look at how climate change is uh, impacting people across the world today, um, countries in the temperate zone, these are primarily the developed countries also uh, who are uh, main contributors to the problem of climate change, but they are facing relatively lesser impacts. And they also have a better capacity for adapting to the changes and also uh, building resilience against the um, uh, drastic changes or uh, extreme weather events that are happening. On the other hand, if you come to the tropical uh, region, uh, then these are the developing countries which have had a relatively low contribution to the problem, but are facing more severe impacts. And this is also important to highlight here that um, uh, one has to think about the cumulative buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, if you think about only the... <clears throat> annual uh, emissions, then currently India and China are among the top five countries. But cumulative emissions over the last 200 years, India's contribution is only about 3% and China about 10%. <coughs> so um, creating the problem, we have had a relatively less contribution. Uh, excuse me, please. Um, but we are facing more impacts because of our geographical location and we have <coughs> relatively less adaptive capacity and uh, resilience. And then there are these uh, small island countries, some of which are facing an existential threat, most severe impact, zero contribution to the problem and hardly any adaptive capacity and resilience. So we cannot have the same conversations with people uh, living in uh, these three regions. The, the conversations have to be different. Uh, this is also another thing. Uh, and this is also the reason why uh, most of the information on the internet coming primarily from temperate zone is, uh, is hampering climate education uh, in the rest of the world. Uh, complexity, well, there are so many things going on right now. If you look at the IPCC reports, 
now um, i mean when the problem could have been solved relatively easily uh, be because of political reasons it was not and therefore it has now become more complex and we have to now focus on not just reducing emissions going into the atmosphere we also need to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere there are uh, certain changes that are now here to stay so we have to adapt to those and there will be more and more uh, extreme events which will lead to loss and damage and we have to somehow deal with that and all of these are linked with each other on the other hand there is the science of climate change but it has a political and economic angle uh, just to give one example scientifically it would be right to say that uh, after the industrial revolution uh, humans started using coal and petroleum extensively and that is what caused this problem but it is not humans across the world which suddenly started using coal and petroleum it was primarily europeans where the industrial revolution was happening and that has triggered uh, the in, in industrial revolution also triggered imperialism which then took this industrial culture across the world and expanded the use of uh, coal and petroleum so all this these political and economic forces also it is important to talk about uh, rather than just keeping it, uh, uh, it in in very very academic terms so all of these complexities are also there which have to be uh, dealt with so uh, basically what i uh, i am trying to say here is that uh, given the climate crisis that we are facing today there is a need to build climate literacy across the world, uh, world. Uh, while we are doing this globally it is important to do it with the local context in each locality the conversation has to be different the historicity also will be different uh, we have to do this very very rapidly but we can't focus only on schools and colleges the generation which is currently in the driver's seat also needs to understand climate change and therefore the education has to be across generations and uh, this must be primarily science based with a long term vision there is often a lot of uh, emotionalism uh, uh, around uh, environmental work and environmental education uh, which also interferes in a way uh, in developing the right understanding again to give a very simple example um, sort of to dramatize uh, the seriousness of climate change a statement has very often been casually made that carbon dioxide is some kind of a pollutant which is scientifically wrong carbon dioxide is a natural constituent of our atmosphere necessary for life to exist on the planet it is just that <coughs> too much of carbon dioxide is becoming a problem for us so it's important to make this distinction that anything and everything which emits carbon dioxide therefore uh, is not contributing to anthropogenic uh, uh, climate change so uh, this this uh, not dropping the ball on science just to convey the seriousness of the problem is very very important so uh, i'll now just describe some of the efforts that i as an individual have uh, tried to do based on uh, this understanding and looking at the uh, the local context that i am working in um so as was mentioned in my introduction uh, i developed a, a carbon footprint calculator for urban indians uh, this work uh, as i said it started as an exercise in the classroom uh, at that time there were a couple of online uh, carbon footprint personal carbon footprint calculators uh, but they were all uh, for the developed world as i said in general the um, uh, the opinion in india was that our carbon footprint is not really high uh, we are not contributing to this problem and we need not worry about this but the urban indians is a separate uh, population group and therefore we have to look at their carbon footprint uh, is a thought that i started uh, uh, sort of sharing with people and to prove that point uh, this calculator has been useful uh, originally it was a piece of paper with equations 
uh, you had to take a calculator, plug in uh, your uh, electricity consumption and um, your petrol diesel consumption, etc., and do the calculation. That maths was very intimidating for people. Then I made an Excel sheet in which you just plug in the numbers and the calculation happens on its own. Uh, but then I teamed up with this uh, startup uh, called Climatora, and now the calculator is available as a web app. Uh, the link uh, you can see on the screen um, uh, on climatora.com, you can find this calculator. It is freely available. Um, you, uh, my focus here was not so much on accuracy, but more on encouraging people to complete the calculation using data which is easily available with them. So you just need to know what is the area of your residential space, your electricity consumption, your cooking energy consumption, your vehicles daily usage and performance. Uh, and that's, that's about it. And uh, if there are any uh, air travels and things like that. So with, with just a few questions answered, you get a sort of a ballpark figure of your uh, family's carbon footprint and therefore your personal carbon footprint. Uh, through this uh, website, we are also trying to now raise awareness around climate vulnerability in the Indian context, because while India is today one of the top annual emitters, it is also among the top countries most vulnerable to impacts of climate change. So there are organizations which have now come up with uh, district-wise uh, vulnerability assessment. So some of that data is uh, available in a uh, easily accessible manner um, on this website. Uh, we are also trying to develop a tie-up with uh, Indian Meteorology Department to have uh, the vulnerability uh, atlas uh, that IMD has come up with uh, linked uh, with this website. Uh, there is a blank space there where a third tool will come, which I am currently working on. Uh, which will help people understand climate vulnerability in their vicinity, where they are staying, what are the risks that are now increasing? Risk of flooding or landslides or heat waves. What is it that is going to increasingly hit them uh, is what they can make an assessment of and therefore hopefully prepare to deal with that. Uh, so we are developing a tool for personal vulnerability assessment. So that will also uh, come here. Uh, then, as I mentioned, I started doing these workshops, uh, which are uh, climate friendly lifestyle workshop. Uh, Government of India has now come up with this whole idea of lifestyle for environment. Uh, I was talking about it since 2008. Uh, this workshop is for urban Indians or adults primarily, um, mostly from the uh, upper middle class or higher income groups, because they are the ones who are contributing to climate change and therefore should know uh, uh, the, the extent of their sins, so to say. Uh, what is covered in the workshop? Well, it starts with climate science and politics, India-specific climate challenges uh, of reducing emissions, but also of dealing with our vulnerabilities. Um, and uh, we do this calculation of carbon footprint, assessment of climate vulnerability, and there is a discussion on possible actions that people can take. Uh, one point that I uh, sort of emphasize in this is that this is not about guilt tripping individuals. We also make it a point to talk in this workshop about how the, um, the civic systems, the economic systems around us are pushing us uh, in making certain lifestyle choices. For example, I live in a city which has a pathetic public transport system. And therefore, if I have to have any hope of reaching places on time, I must have my own vehicle. So owning a personal vehicle should not make me feel guilty. It should make me feel uh, that I should become an active citizen and push my local civic system to improve the public transport system. So that is the kind of messaging that we focus on in this workshop. Uh, people generally start charting a journey towards uh, lowering their carbon footprint uh, as a result of this workshop. Uh, we also now have a WhatsApp group 
uh, called citizens of sustainable city uh, which people can join uh, because many times what happens is uh, you feel that you are the only one who is uh, concerned about climate change everybody around you is not but there are many such crazy people spread uh, across india and they can all uh, sort of uh, create a support group for each other that's the that's the idea behind this whatsapp group we have managed to address uh, constructively some of the civic issues in the city uh, through this group over the last few years um, another uh, activity which uh, we started uh, uh, around 2016 Uh, is this idea of carbon neutral campus um educational institutes will uh, have a key role to play in um, in increasing uh, climate literacy and uh, uh, therefore uh, i started advocating that uh, colleges and schools should take on carbon neutrality targets and uh, we will teach you how to do that so um, now uh, especially globally everybody is taking carbon neutrality targets and um, companies have also started doing that educational uh, campuses are already doing it but what is generally happening is they will hire some consultant who will come in do the assessment suggest some techno technological fixes and that's the end of it what we do is slightly different uh we ask the college uh, to form a group of students and teachers we handhold them we teach them how to do uh, an assessment of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from their campus and also of the sinks that are available on the campus many academic campuses also have green spaces so we ask them uh, we teach them how to um, account the, uh, the carbon uh, removal capacity of those patches and then on the basis of these calculations they can develop and uh, then then implement an action plan and move their campus towards carbon neutrality the uh, immediate impact of this is that people start thinking Uh, about uh, the emissions also as a decision making factor uh, in making organizational decisions uh, the the a climate aligned work culture evolves on the campus the campus will eventually go carbon neutral but more importantly students who will pass out will take this climate aligned thinking in their work spaces and therefore help um, transform the various sectors Uh, which are also uh, big contributors to climate change in the country uh, that's that's the overall thought process in this uh, we have now recently joined hands with uh, pune knowledge cluster uh, and uh, they are helping us reach out to uh, academic institutions across the country uh, with this uh, this this idea um, i also realize that as uh, more and more uh, governments and therefore uh, corporates and other institutions are taking on carbon neutrality targets or targets to lower their carbon emissions uh, there has has to be verification of that so we are going to need a lot of people who will be able to do carbon accounting or greenhouse gas accounting and there are no such uh, uh, degrees or co diplomas or courses running uh, in the country so i have created this online course which is also being offered through uh, climatora uh, and we are getting good response for this several universities have now uh, agreed to offer this course as an elective and we are still talking to more universities but uh, this uh, this in a way uh, sort of turns the climate crisis into a career option also where positively uh, one can uh, impact solving Uh, this problem uh, while making money out of it so that's that's uh, uh, another uh, uh, you know way of looking at climate change which i always try to uh, emphasize on while talking to uh, uh, my students so uh, these are uh, some of the things that i have been doing and recently i got an opportunity to talk about this uh, in a in a conference which was organized by um uh, some groups in malaysia where they are trying to figure out how to do climate change education in malaysia and uh, there also this 
struck a chord and uh, as i have said everything that i do uh, whether it is my work in renewable energy or uh, this work around climate change education all my work is open source um i would be happy to share the carbon footprint calculator uh, with people they will have to of course in other countries they will have to tweak it to suit their uh, requirements the emission factors will have to change and so on but uh, if that is easy to do um i feel that that one instrument is a very powerful instrument of getting people interested uh, encouraging dialogue and conversations around climate change but since um i am talking to all of you and most of you would be uh, in the academic field uh, and working as educators i feel that uh, as we address this uh, global crisis we must in academic institutions irrespective of uh, uh, subjects whether it is physics chemistry or sociology and anthropology uh, climate change has linkages with all of these we must revisit our core structures and learning outcomes and try to embed uh, an understanding of uh, of the relevant dimensions of climate change in our uh, course structures themselves and uh, educational institutions and academic institutions of course should walk the talk uh, they should go low carbon to the best extent possible and you have uh, trained uh, teachers you have classrooms which are equipped with all kinds of educational aids uh, and these are not occupied 24 by 7 so make use of this infrastructure to reach out to general public to help create a mass scale movement uh, for building uh, climate literacy we do need uh, something on the scale of adult education which was the mission carried out uh, in india at one point Uh, to really develop that understanding around climate change in people's mind but we have to remember that the messaging needs to be different for different demographic graphic groups um uh, the the relevance is also so for example you can't go in a village or a tribal community and start talking about reducing carbon emissions there the conversation has to be on what changes are happening around them because of climate change and how they can deal with that whereas in an urban uh, location the conversation uh, has to start from reducing carbon emissions and then talking about how bad uh, urban development is meeting climate change and creating um, uh, uh, even more severe impacts as we are seeing in many cities uh, across north india today so uh, those uh, uh, mind that mindfulness has to be there one can't have a one size fit all kind of a program uh, so uh, these are uh, some of the learnings that i have had uh, in this this journey with uh, or trying to create uh, climate change education uh, frameworks uh, i would be happy to answer questions and also uh, suggestions from uh, all of you for uh, 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 you know doing this more effectively uh, thank you very much thank you very much uh, dr karve that was very inspiring uh, let me just see uh, what questions have come uh, i see a question in the chat box Uh, which asks you um thank you for the nice presentation i think it echoes everyone's views um i have tried the carbon footprint calculator it is simple and easy uh, to use uh, what but what is the unit t well uh, yeah, it looks yeah. like uh, carbon yeah, carbon dioxide that, yeah. e eq yes it is um, it is uh, it is tons of carbon dioxide equivalent so uh, that is uh, although we call it carbon footprint it is uh, uh, measuring the impact of all greenhouse gas emissions uh, different greenhouse gases have different warming potentials and therefore um, uh, one has to sort of scale it so it's like currency conversion if you have some uh, dollars and some rupees and you want to know how much money you have you will convert everything in one currency and then you will add up so something similar is done uh, taking into account the different uh, warming potentials everything is converted in term terms of tons of carbon dioxide equivalent and then added up so that is why the unit of carbon footprint is is tons of co2 equivalent thank you um so a couple of more questions have come 
uh, how do you measure uh, GAJ, especially on campuses? Yeah. So uh, wh whether it is on campuses or anywhere, you, uh, you don't directly go around with gas meters or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, these are uh, conversion equations. So for example, if you are using a certain um, uh, units of electricity, then we know in India uh, per unit of electricity used how much emission uh, happens. So that data is available. That is the emission factor or the petrol or diesel that you use, how much emissions are associated with one liter of petrol use. So those emission factors are there. Uh, so these are the, you measure the energy usage and then um, convert that into uh, this ton, tons of CO2 equivalent, basically uh, using these equations. As far as the sinks is concerned, that's actually something which um, not much work has happened there. Uh, even the standard carbon accounting tools are not yet talking about measuring carbon sinks. But as we uh, start uh, talking about carbon sequestration, because uh, we now also need to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, how much you have removed, how do you know that? So for that, you will have to develop uh, the maths for uh, doing those conversions. A couple of people have tried to do this and these are very approximate um, calculations, estimations based on the height and girth of a tree, basically how much biomass is produced. Uh, that can be linked with how much carbon has been removed. So when it comes to uh, using forestation as a means of removing carbon dioxide, uh, the biomass is measured or estimated and you can convert that into uh, uh, carbon sink capacity. So these type of, uh, uh, th that is the kind of a logic that is used there. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so there is another question by, from Anissa, who says your calculator is based on some calculation. Uh, how are uneducated people to use it? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, that is why I said that uh, now that it is a web app, you don't have to do the calculation. You just have to enter that this is my electricity uh, units mm -hmm. uh, used per month. And the calculation will happen automatically and uh, you will get the information about the emissions. Uh, those who are interested to understand the calculation, the Excel file actually contains all the equations. So you, one can study that and figure it out. Yeah. Right, right. That, that's actually a very nice development for, for people who might even be educated, but a bit lazy to do yeah. the calculation. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So um, actually, someone did want you to leave your email uh, in the last slide a little longer, but you could yeah. maybe put it in the chat box yeah, for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. So um, another one uh, has asked you about, well, great work that uh, uh, and says, are you considering a life cycle assessment to know more about the impacts? Yes, actually, uh, life cycle assessment is uh, another uh, sort of uh, work in progress kind of a thing. There are uh, tools which uh, manufacturing industries, uh, etc. Are, uh, uh, are using and um, uh, very complicated, I mean, expensive also softwares. So um, we have, in fact, been sort of doing brainstorming on this issue that um, uh, there is a bunch of us who are trying to create an identity uh, as green entrepreneurs and sort of have a chamber of commerce of green entrepreneurs. And one of the ideas we have is, can we say that the products that we are selling have a certain life cycle emissions? And therefore, we need to have simple tools which will allow these uh, small uh, uh, startups to do these sort of, even if it is a back of the envelope calculation, but we can then say that uh, the, the uh, product that we are selling uh, will have this much emission associated with it. And then you can compare it with a conventional uh, uh, product and so on. Uh, so that is, as I said, work in progress. Uh, we will get there at some point. So um, another question was, have you distinguished different acceptance from women or men in your workshops? Hmm. Uh, that's an interesting yeah. question, actually. Uh, in general, I have had uh, more response uh, from women uh, than men. 
for for the workshops and okay. uh, even the in general i mean that's the thing with environmental concerns also uh, women seem to be more uh, concerned and uh, more willing to step out and take some action uh, than men uh, yeah. that 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 is definitely there yes okay yeah <laughs> that's interesting so i think uh, i do not uh, see any more questions here um, um so i was just uh, curious you know things like uh, like all of us are meeting online now and not actually flying to a city yes, so yes. we are probably a sort yes. of reduction reducing carbon <laughs> costs a bit yes. right uh, yes definitely uh, so because uh, we found that in the in, in our institute uh, taking a whole lot of meetings online uh, well made it cheaper <laughs> in terms <laughs> of money but i suppose it also makes it cheaper yeah. for uh, so you know in fact yes. i wanted to yeah. ask a question about oh, it yes please you please know? sir yeah During yeah during the yeah. pandemic uh, we had lot of discussions uh, in iupap also uh, on you know hybrid conferences and reduce the number of in person conferences to reduce the carbon footprint but mm. now again the mm, conferences are increasing so i was wondering if there is a you know kind of a policy or something can be done to carve yeah. this so that yeah yeah so on a related One question thing, in the uh, chat book is that yeah. the noted effect of emissions as uh, or climate as a result of pandemic yeah it's a related so yeah please dr okay. karve ha um yes so uh, online meetings definitely have a lower uh, carbon emissions than uh, face to face meetings uh, but one has to think about the effectiveness of the meetings also i mean yeah. some in some situations uh, it's more important to meet face to face than rather than just online so uh, yeah. it's not always only about climate yeah. change concerns <laughs> one has to uh, consider the effectiveness that is point one yeah. secondly yeah. what we started doing within our networks is that uh, whenever we have uh, face to face meetings uh, we try to at least measure uh, our carbon emissions yeah. and uh, whatever is possible uh, given the budgetary constraints and other constraints so for example there are now airlines Uh, which offer uh, uh, an opportunity to offset uh, the carbon emissions of your trip uh, there are ways to get to places by train rather than by flying so we try to take those routes for reducing the travel related emissions uh, at the conference venue we avoid bottled water uh, we avoid giving this fancy conference bags and things like that uh, we try to find venues Uh, which are uh, green and low carbon which is possible now in some cities uh, so by doing these small things one can reduce if not uh, you know uh, eliminate or go carbon neutral uh, is always not possible but definitely one can make the effort consciously to reduce carbon emissions associated with any event and activity and that is the climate aligned thinking that i am talking about which sort of gets embedded if you start Uh, measuring then that thought process starts coming that if i am buying something what is the emission uh, if i am doing something what is the emission if i am undertaking a journey what is the emission and then how i can uh, reduce that so even if everybody starts thinking along those lines uh, that makes a lot of difference a bit like the calories which you put on food yeah. which makes yeah. you a little right. sensitive to <laughs> right. what you eat <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. yes <laughs> yeah thank you very much i think uh, we uh, are there any more questions from anywhere i i think there is one but maybe priya can I... type the answer or if you want to take uh... it please go ahead yeah uh, okay I, i'll read I it out to you it. yeah please i'll yeah, read it out to you it. it is from dorothy it says can you tell us if you're doing anything with the major polluters for example industry shipping transportation i like your approach of reminding us what we can do as individuals but we know that without major polluters changing their exactly. approach we cannot reverse the alarming situation exactly and that is exactly the message that we are also emphasizing that while as individuals we can make a beginning that is not enough uh, it is the economic system as a whole which needs to change and that will change if a large number of people start demanding change so it works both for changing politics as well as economic systems that if uh, 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 people can vote with their wallets also 
and demand from industries that we will buy your products and services only if the, these are leading to lower uh, if you if we see you undertaking uh, a, 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 an honest journey towards lowering your uh, carbon emissions so from that perspective climate literacy is important economic systems will change only if that kind of a pressure builds on them and they see their profit margins getting hurt yeah, I think there are a few more questions, but maybe Priya can answer them in yeah, sure. and we can move on. I yeah, just yeah. want a very short comment. Priya has also done a lot of work in the um, environment uh, friendly fuels and stoves. So please look up her uh, web page and learn more about it from. Yeah. Thanks, okay. thanks Vandana. And, and Thank I'll you. put my, uh, my email in chat also. After. Yes, uh, because some people wanted yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, Thank um, you. so Vandana, so in interest of time, we move on to the last yeah. one. Is that yeah. right? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much again. And uh, uh, there was a, clearly a lot of interest. And uh, uh, I will now move on to the last uh, uh, talk of the session. Um, so, our last speaker is Dr. Rupjyoti Gogoi. I think, uh, yes, there she is. Okay, so uh, so she is an assistant professor in the Department of Physics in Tejpur University, Assam. Uh, she's also a visiting associate of Ayuka, uh, and she's been a visiting associate since 2013, and in the executive council member of the Astronomical Society of India. Um, uh, she's actively involved in organizing different astronomy-related activities and promoting astronomy, research, and education in Northeast India. So her current research interests uh, include exploring interstellar dust, AGNs, and galaxies using observational data at different wave bands. Um, she is a, a GSAT member of this uh, DST project called uh, GATI, the GATI pi uh, pilot project in Tejpur. Uh, so GATI stands for Gender Advancement for Transforming Institutions. Um, uh, so with that, uh, I invite uh, Dr. Gogoi to uh, give her presentation. We're looking uh, forward thank to Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Yes. Is it visible? Ah, yes, it's come. Thank you. Yes, it's okay. come. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, so am I fairly audible? Yes, yeah. we can okay. see you. Huh? Okay. 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 Can you go to the uh, screen share mode? Full screen. Full screen mode. Full oh, screen. Uh, yeah, I have done actually. Mm. Uh, it's in full screen mode only. Uh, can't you uh, see it in full screen? Mode? I mean, we, we see, uh, well, uh, it's, it's okay, but maybe, you know, in the view uh, or something if you uh, the share we're, the we're share just seeing slide yeah yeah maybe share yeah uh, now yeah, yeah. yeah now uh, you can... is it okay. not yet you can go to slide so that works uh actually i uh, i mean uh slide so mode only i don't know why it is not uh, okay uh, we, we, I, I mean, at least it's it's okay for me. Yeah, Should we just carry okay, on, Vandana? Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. okay, okay, or, okay. Uh, okay. I, uh, I think uh, maybe... Is it if okay it, or not? No. Uh, I, I think mean, we carry is, on. That is better, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think just yes. Just carry on. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. okay yeah. I mean, we see the slides. We just see the, the you know, the runner at the side. It's, it's okay. Please carry on. Uh, then uh, just give me a second. Maybe I will open. Okay, okay. Uh, just a, a second. If it doesn't slide. work, this is fine. Yeah. Uh, no, it's okay. I will just uh, uh, use a, a different file. Uh, if that works for you, I'll just uh, see that. Um, sorry for the technical glitch. First, click the zoom window, then click the slide. Yes, 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 yes. I'm trying to do that. Just one second. Uh, yeah, I have to first get the slide. Okay. The slide should be after the share. Yeah, I'm just uh, using the PDF file. Uh, maybe this time it might be uh, better. Just uh, trying to see if it works. Okay, so. Uh, is it better now? Yeah, it is. Okay. Yes, this is. Uh, yeah. 
ओके ओके थैंक यू सो मच यस दिस इज गुड हां दिस इज नाइस वंडरफुल ओके प्लीज कैन ओके या सो गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन Uh, and uh, as uh, i'm already being introduced i am rujyoti from tejpur university india and uh, i am going to present before you our work to investigate the origin of diffuse far ultraviolet emission in galaxies what we are doing here is that uh, we are trying to find the primary candidate which is responsible for the diffuse fub background in galaxies and uh, the primary candidate is interstellar dust which is present in the galaxies uh, the dust which are present in the interstellar medium they are responsible for scattering the starlight there are of course some other components as well like uh, ebl extra galactic background light and uh, in this work we are trying to see if dust scattering alone can account for the diffuse fub background or not so um i am doing this work with another women dr p shalima we are long time collaborators she is from manipal center for natural sciences in india so this is the plan of the talk first of all i will be introducing the screens to the audience the importance composition and life cycle of dust grains then i will speak about the effects of dust like uh, scattering and extinction then i will introduce to you the dust scattering model which we are using in this work and then i will tell you about the application of the model to some specific location and uh, finally as communicated by the organizers i will be talking a very little bit about my journey uh, in this dust universe so when we say interstellar dust they exist in the interstellar medium that is the space between the stars and uh, in the interstellar medium only 1% is dust we are tiny pieces of solid particles composed mainly of carbon silicon like that and uh, 99% of the interstellar medium is gas now when we talk about a typical milky way type of galaxy 1/6 of the total galaxy mass is baryonic out of that 1/6 only 1/6 is the interstellar medium and in that interstellar medium as i have mentioned in my earlier slide just 1% is the dust so it's a very minuscule fraction of a galaxy yet very important and powerful why we can understand from this figure so this portion is because of the starlight because of the stellar emission the light emitted by the stars in that particular galaxy and uh, as you can see that uh, this portion is because of the dust emission what happens is that the stars in that galaxy it will emit you be visible and the near eye light which will be absorbed by the dust grains uh, which are present in the space between the stars and the uh, dust will then reprocess that light and it will emit the light in the infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum so this portion is totally dust dominated that's why you can see that 50% information of the galaxy we get from the dust which is there in that particular galaxy that's why it is very important to understand what type of dust is there how it is reprocessing the light as we can see examples of some external galaxies we can see very beautiful dust lands we can see some dust rings so this says that all galaxies are dusty to how much extent they are dusty it will of course vary from galaxy to galaxy and also inside a particular galaxy the type of dust which is present there will vary from different location to another location so talking about the composition of the dust grains they are solid particles 
The size may vary from 0 0.01 to 1 micron. They are primarily composed of elements, which are, of course, abundant in the interstellar medium. They are mainly comprised of carbon and silicates. 28% of dust mass is in carbon. And carbon may be in the form of solid carbon, like graphite, diamond, or it may be in the form of hydrocarbons, like uh, PHS, which we call as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and 72% uh, in other compounds like silicates, oxides like that. And uh, talking about the formation medium, they are formed in chemically enriched pool and uh, dense medium. And uh, this is the structure of a dust grain. It has a centrally placed core, which is surrounded by an icy mantle. And uh, it has a sticky outer surface. And this surface also acts as a chemical factory because simple molecules can grow on the dust surface. Like you can see in this figure, hydrogen molecule is being formed on the uh, sticky dust surface. Now, talking about the life, uh, life cycle of dust, it is very closely related to the life cycle of a star. Actually, I can say that the life of dust grain starts when a star dies. We can see this star forming nebula inside which baby stars or proto stars are being born. This we call a stellar nursery. So this nebula are uh, thick clouds of gas and dust. So these uh, baby stars are being born there. And after that, depending on the mass of the star, the star will take different course during their lifetime. And uh, finally, our sun-like star, it will become a red giant. And uh, as we know that the more massive stars, they may become a super red giant. Uh, but whatever is the case, whether it becomes a red giant or a super red giant, finally, it will shed its uh, outer layers into the interstellar medium or uh, the life of the star will end as a violent supernova explosion and it will inject its inner materials to the surrounding space. Thus, it will enrich the interstellar medium with materials from which the next generation of stars will form. And the cycle continues. Now, uh, when we mention about the effects of dust grains, then we speak about extinction and reddening. In this figure, you can see that this is some distant object which we are observing. And uh, this object is emitting light of different wavelength, which is passing through a dusty cloud where we have dust grains, which are shown by these dots. And uh, the blue light, as we know, will be scattered by the dust grains because the uh, size of the dust grain is comparable to the size of the wavelength of the blue light. The red light will manage to pass through this dusty region. And for this observer, this object will appear a little redder than it really is. So this scattering and absorption together we call as extinction, dust extinction. And uh, extinction will result in reduced intensity and reddening. So whenever we observe this star from this side, then it will appear as a red star. We will see it as more redder than it really is. And uh, if we observe this dusty cloud from this side, then this dust cloud will glow as a very beautiful blue reflection nebula. So these are the effects of dust. Now, how much reddening will be there will, of course, depend on the line of sight. Like uh, uh, if there is more material along the line of sight, then more reddening will occur. That is the reason why distant stars appear redder than the nearby ones. And uh, these are some of the parameters which we need for our model. So uh, the color index of a star, which we define like P minus P, then we also uh, say color excess as uh, excess of P minus P. And RV is the ratio of general to selective extinction. Uh, so talking about the extinction, it depends on the wavelength. In this figure, you can see 
this uh, axis shows you the wavelength and uh, this is for extinction. So we can see that shorter the wavelength is, stronger is the extinction. And uh, that's where uh, we see that there is a bump in the extinction curve. This type of curve we call is the extinction curve. And uh, we see a bump here, which is known as 2175 angstrom bump. Now, uh, if we talk about the extinction curves for our own galaxy, Milky Way, and two neighboring galaxies, LMC and SMC, then this is the comparison uh, between the extinction curves. Here, this uh, pink dashed line, it shows the extinction curve for our own galaxy, Milky Way. And uh, this line with the red dots and the blue dots, it shows the extinction curve for Milky Way, uh, sorry, LMC. So what we can see is that uh, the nature of dust which is present in our uh, own galaxy, it's similar to the nature of dust which is there in the large Magellanic cloud. But when we observe the extinction curve for the small Magellanic cloud, then we see that this 2175 angstrom bump is not there. It is nearly flattened, which says that the dust which is there in SMC is different. It has different nature than the dust in Milky Way and LFC. So these extinction curves are a way to understand the nature of dust. Now the presence of this pump, this uh, 2175 angstrom pump, this is attributed to the presence of something called this polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which I had mentioned in one of my earlier slides. So they are essentially collection of benzene rings like this. And the uh, PHS also show characteristic emission features at different infrared wave bands. Now, we may also see clusters of PHS, which are called as VHCs or very small grains. These VHCs are more stable than individual polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon molecules in regions of high radiation field. That's why they can exist in the center of H2 region. Now, uh, talking about the factors which uh, affect scattering, of course, the composition, size, and shape of the dust grains will affect the scattering. Now, there is another factor called as phase function asymmetry factor, G. This is also called as dust optical constant. So, G tells us whether the scattering is isotropic like this or uh, whether it is backscattering or whether it is forward scattering. Now, whenever a scattering happens, then the new direction for the scattered photon is being calculated by using the Hani greenstein uh, phase function. So this is uh, from Hani greenstein 1941. Albedo is another dust optical constant, which is also called as reflectivity. It is the ratio of scattered, inten uh, scattered to incident intensity. It may vary in between 0 to 1. 0 means uh, no reflectance. 1 means 100% reflectance. The scattering will, of course, depend on the distribution of dust and also how the stars are distributed in that particular region of space, which we call this relative geometry of stars and dust. Now, uh, talking about the model, it's a very simple model, actually. What we do is that we assume that the whole galaxy is filled with some boxes. The boxes are like this. And uh, in the box, you can see these uh, blue dots. These are some dust grains. And uh, here is a star. The star is emitting a photon. The photon strikes a dust grain. And uh, it takes a new direction. The new direction is calculated by this scattering phase function. Then if it comes this way, then we can collect it in a detector. We can view it from this side. Or it may also uh, take a new direction where it meets another dust grain. And uh, again, it will change direction and the process will go on. Now here, this model, uh, which was first uh, used by my collaborator in 2006, uh, in this model, we can use in two different ways. One, if we 
constraint that a photon will suffer one scattering only. Then we call it as single scattering model. And uh, if we allow the photon to undergo multiple scattering, we call it as multiple scattering. Now, uh, when we consider multiple scattering, then we will put some condition in our model, like uh, scattering continues uh, until the photon leaves that particular area, I mean the area under consideration, or its intensity drops to some negligible value. So we will put some cutoff. Now, uh, what we do is that we use some input parameter, like uh, I have mentioned the factors which will affect the scattering by the dust grains. So we need information about the stars which are there in that particular region. We need information about their spectra. So these are easily available from different catalog. Uh, like, uh, yeah, there are so many such uh, stellar catalog. Then we need some assumption about dust distribution. This is uh, actually uh, easy for close locations, but whenever we go to some uh, distant location, then assumption about dust distribution uh, becomes little difficult. Then uh, what we need is that we need the observed UV, the observed intensity, and uh, for that we use different observation missions, like we can use Galax, Fuse, Voyager, or we can use our own uh, AstroSat, which is India's indigenous satellite, uh, that UVIT uh, payload is there. We can use UVIT data to know the observed intensity in the FUV band. And uh, what we do is that uh, this albedo and Z, I have already discussed, this we call as the optical constant. So with different combinations of uh, A and G, albedo and phase function asymmetry factor, we try to estimate the output intensity. And uh, one thing here is that, as I have mentioned that we can either go for single scattering model or we can go for multiple scattering model. The type of light which we are discussing here, the diffuse far ultraviolet background light, which we also call as diffuse galactic light. So that scattering is because of optically thin medium. And for optically thin medium, we can safely go for single scattering model. Or uh, we can also go for uh, multiple scattering model and then we can just uh, compare the results. We have done that. And what we have seen is that a single scattering model can give fairly a good result. It gives almost similar result than the uh, multiple scattering model. So whenever we consider some optically thick medium, then we have to go for multiple scattering model. Uh, well, so I am sharing one work which we reported in 2018. Why I'm sharing this work here is that, as I mentioned that this model was initially uh, used in 2006, but it was used for some centrally placed dust locations. So this was the first time when we used the model for far away location. Uh, this is for Orion, this uh, red mark over here. It shows the Orion center and these are the central stars which we have considered uh, shown by these green dots. Then these uh, gray dots, they show the dust locations. And you can also see these blue stars. Blue stars are actually the reference stars. So these reference stars we are just using to get an estimate of the extinction and hydrogen column density near our dust locations, which we need as input. So we got uh, a pretty good result here with uh, albedo value 0.7 and phase function asymmetry factor 0.6. And uh, in this work, we found that the FUV light scattering is predominantly from the foreground dust that provides for at least 80% of the scattered radiation. In this uh, three-dimensional scattered plot, we see the distances to our dust locations. Now, similar kind of uh, dust scattering model we are using for different regions of LMC, large Magellanic Cloud and SMC, Small Magellanic Cloud. 
because of time constraint, I'm not showing those uh, results here. Uh, but I would like to show one result for a little far away galaxy, which is 11 million light years away from us, UGC 4305. So for UGC 4305 also, we have seen that the single scattering model gives pretty good result with uh, albedo value 0.2 and the G value 0.1, corresponding to wavelength 154.1 nanometer. That's why I just want to uh, make some concluding remark that uh, in our work, we have seen that dust scattering alone can account for the diffuse far ultraviolet background to significant extent near star forming region, whatever region we have considered so far, they are star forming region. And uh, as future improvement, what we are planning is that we are planning some IR modeling, infrared modeling. Actually, we are doing that, uh, but uh, we are yet to get some very good result. That's why I have not included. So with the help of infrared modeling, we will try to constrain the dust properties in a better way, in a more convincing way. As I have mentioned that we are using the single scattering model for large Magellanic cloud. Here I can show you two model images for the FUV scattering by dust in a star forming region in the large Magellanic cloud, which we call as 30 Doradus. So um, this is uh, what I wanted to share about our work. This is one area in which I'm working. Now, when I got this communication email from the organizers, um, then they also asked me to uh, speak a little bit about my journey. So it's uh, nothing uh, special. I belong to a very uh, small place called Chaki Road, uh, which is in Morigaon district of Assam. This is the map of India and uh, in the map of India, this is Assam, my state. Assam is very famous for its wildlife, very famous for the tea plantation, uh, famous for the blue hills here, and also for Brahmaputra River and its tributaries. It's, uh, it has a very rich flora and fauna. In Assam, this is the map of Assam. This is my district, Morigaon. I belong to this place called Morigaon. From where I started my journey, I did my schooling from Jagirut Higher Secondary School. Uh, in Morigaon. Then I moved to Guwahati, which is the capital of uh, Assam. I did my plus two from Cotton College, which is now Cotton University, and it has successfully completed 100 years. And uh, after that, there were some family problems because of which I moved back to my hometown, Jagirot, from where I completed my graduation. And uh, then for my master's and PhD, I joined, Go I joined Guwahati University, which is again in the capital of Assam, Guwahati. I did my PhD from Guwahati University. I joined my current workplace, Tejpur University in the year 2011. And in between my PhD and uh, my job at Tejpur University, I served at uh, two other institutions one private university and one government college in Assam. Then when I joined the Tejpur University in uh, 2011, I uh, had to struggle a little bit to resume my research career because uh, I took a break from research career because uh, I was in a college where I had to take uh, 19 hours of classes per week. So there was hardly any time for research. So there was a break in between because of which uh, I had to uh, struggle for some time to resume my research work. But then here I should mention the name of IUCA, the Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics. My department is having very good relation with IUCA Pune. Uh, since 1999, my department was established in 1998. So through that connection, actually, I visited Ayuka. I met uh, people there. I met uh, faculty members, the postdoc fellows, uh, the research scholars. It took some time. It was uh, difficult. But anyways, 
uh, then I could uh, resume my research work. And uh, that's why I'm thankful to both Tejpur University and Ayuga for giving me the platform to grow. And uh, now, yes, I'm happy with whatever I am doing. This is my team. And uh, I always try to keep a balance between uh, male and female, as this is a conference on women in physics. That's why I'm mentioning this. My university gives permission to take uh, four PhD students at a time. So this is my first batch of PhD students, where you can see 50% uh, female and 50% uh, male. Uh, this girl, Pranjupriya, completed her PhD now. She is in South Africa. Very soon, she will be moving to Paris for her second postdoc. And Kukaya is uh, in South Africa for her first postdoc. Uh, Ansuman recently published a nature paper in July 2022, uh, where he discussed FUV emission in a sample of distant dwarf galaxies. My first PhD student, Gautam, whose work I was uh, discussing in 2018 paper, he did his postdoc from IISC and now he is well settled in Guwahati. He is working in a college. And here in the second batch of PhD students, you see that the ratio of uh, male to female is uh, disturbed. Uh, this is not appreciable at all. The reason is that for two consecutive years, actually, we were not getting female PhD candidates who were interested to do astronomy and astrophysics. So that is the only reason. It's not because of any uh, biasness. But I really hope that with more girls in my team, I can build a very strong group and we can do some really good work in future. And also, we are involved in promoting astronomy, teaching, research, and uh, education. We go to some nearby schools. This is a photograph from a nearby school. We used to visit the schools for some astronomy outreach programs. We organize some sci watching programs. Then we organize some meetings, data analysis workshops, many things. We also organize the SCRB school on observational astronomy, one TMT meeting also we organized. So like that, we are just uh, trying to uh, develop this part of the country. We are uh, trying to contribute a little bit. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. And uh, my sincere thanks to the organizers for inviting me to deliver this talk. This is my first Women in Physics conference. I'm really very glad to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gobe. Uh, right. Um, so that was a very interesting talk. So let me read. Um, let me check uh, how many questions. OK, so I have a question here. Uh, how, okay. is, how is the origin of dust? Uh, how do they evolve? and uh, what are few of the uh, i'm presuming models of dust investigation uh, yeah actually um, you were asking me the um, life cycle of dust uh, i actually this question is is from someone who's a, uh, who's a participant uh, okay, so, okay. I, uh, so I'm just reading out the question. For, ah, okay, okay. No, no problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, actually, there was a, uh, a slide in my talk where I have shown this. This one. Uh, this actually tells us about the formation, transformation, and destruction of dust inside galaxies. So as uh, I have mentioned that whenever a star dies, then whatever material is inside that star, uh, that material it uh, uh, injects to the surrounding medium. And uh, from there only we get the uh, new dust particles. Again, they accumulate to uh, form these thick clouds of gas and dust, which we call as nebula. So uh, is that what uh, the participant asked? I don't know. I presume so. I think that's yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, it's a, right, right. Uh, so there is another question too. Uh, have you studied some kind of aggregation effect on dust? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, we are not doing that. But uh, there are my collaborators. They do astrochemistry. Uh, they are studying uh, those type of things. 
we just uh, study the observation, the observed data we take, and then we try to fit with our model, and then we try to understand the nature of the dust, which is present here in that particular sample, which we are considering. Um, are there any questions that I'm missing, Vandana, or? Uh... No, I don't see any questions yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so maybe I, I'll just ask a brief one. Um, so in your models, uh, how sensitive is, are the results to the dust distribution that you assume? Yeah, actually, uh, it's, um, it's sensitive. But uh, the problem is that whenever we consider some nearby location, we have very good information about those locations. We can see it very nicely. So we know what type of dust is there. It's in the form of a sheet. It's in the form of a veil. Uh, we know that. So for nearby locations, it's very easy for us to model. But uh, whenever we consider some um, far away location, like that's why I mentioned these two things. One is Oran, which is uh, pretty, I mean, relatively closer. And one is that uh, other galaxy, which is a distant galaxy. So whenever we have a far away a location that problem we face that's why what we do is that we just use different combinations and different conditions so we just vary the dust distances we just vary the dust composition so like that we vary the parameters in the model uh, so that it matches with the right right is it very sensitive to this variation the result that you get i mean yeah to uh, you can say that uh, to some extent it's sensitive Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So, um, since I don't see any other questions, and I believe there is, uh, oh, there is, oh, there is one more. Okay. How is the study of dust important in the context of understanding stellar evolution or galaxy evolution in the universe? We'll yes. take this as the last question then. Yeah. Okay. Please. Uh, so actually, the thing is that uh, if we are interested in any facet of astronomy then we should know the dust. Because like, uh, suppose you are studying a galaxy, then uh, in that galaxy, I, uh, I have shown one uh, figure in my talk, we see only 50% uh, light of that galaxy, uh, which is uh, like uh, emitted by the stars, which are there. Uh, but uh, rest 50% information we get from the dust emission. So that's why it is very important to understand the dust which is there in that particular galaxy or whatever we study. Like suppose we study a star, we do not get the intrinsic uh, starlight. Uh, we have to correct the stellar spectrum uh, because the dust will redden it. That's why if we are interested in anything in astronomy, then we have to get rid of the dust first. So uh, that's where dust is important. We should uh, know what type of dust is there because we have to correct for dust uh, everything, no matter whether we are studying galaxy or star. Uh, so that is the importance of dust, actually. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> okay. So uh, I think uh, that brings us uh, to a close. The only thing is that there was a small message in the chat about somebody who wanted your email. But I'm sure your okay. papers have it. But if you want to put yeah. it on chat, that's all right. So yeah, I, yeah. Um, um, so sure. I'll bring the session to a close. So, so a big thank yeah. you to all the three speakers. Uh, uh, we had some wonderful talks. Everyone stuck to time, and uh, there was lively discussion. So uh, with that, um, uh, over uh, to Vandana and Subrahman. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, we really had very broad con converse. I think. Uh, going from quantum computation to the cosmic dust. We had a very nice talk by Rukmanjiri who talked about the breakthrough developments in quantum computation with neutral atoms. And Rukmanjiri talked about cosmic dust creation and destroying everything. And Priya brought in a completely new perspective on developing climate literacy in talking of the things. So uh, I, with, on this note, I think we will now bring the session to close. And last but not least, very, very important. Thank you, Sudeshna, for a wonderful sharing of the session and keeping it very lively and accepting the thing. Okay, thank wonderful. you so much.